I'm so excited for our lunch and learn today. Today we've got an incredible guest. We're here to talk about how we can improve our people management, improve our leadership, and boost our team performance. Our guest is Kevin Livingston. Kevin is the founder of Pedal Hard, where he has created a proprietary training system for cyclists and triathletes. Kevin is also a former professional cyclist who rode in multiple Tour de France's with Lance Armstrong. He has got an incredible story about how he's transitioned from being a pro athlete to starting his own business and really motivating a team, whether it be for sports or for your business. I think it can apply to many different ways. Kevin, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Garrett. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank so, you for the nice intro. Yeah, of course. I mean, Kevin, I think what's fascinating, I, I, I don't get to interview that many professional athletes. And so I'd love to start because I think as an executive, we think about this a lot, or just as a leader, as a professional, we think about this a lot of just how do we take our lives, our careers to the next level? And I think sometimes it can be for business. Sometimes it can be for sport. When did you go from a, a really good athlete to a professional cyclist? Like, what was that thing that clicked for you, that changed for you? And uh, Could you share that story of, like, when that happened and what happened in doing all that? Um, sure. Uh, you know, I was so young when I found cycling. Um, I sort of always go back. So yeah, you're going to have to bear with me. Cyclists talk always in terms of years, you know. They're always counting like, oh, and this year I was this category, and then I was an amateur, and then I was a professional. So um, I always say to my wife, whenever I tell stories now, she's like, stop telling the years. You, start, you, you show your age, especially when I'm talking to like a younger crowd, kids and stuff. Um, but I, I, I just think from an early age, I, I, don't, I think maybe my energy, I was always really interested in sports. It sounds funny, but I remember my grandfather used to always say that I grew up in St. Louis, and when we would go see him, I just remember him in his chair, and he'd smoke his pipe, and he had his drink, and he used to grab me when I was running through, and I was, you know, little, like, I don't know, six to eight years old, and he'd say, this, this kid's going to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. That's when they were our football team, you know, and uh, – but I always had that. I was always like kicking a soccer ball or foot, carrying a football in a picture or doing something. But, you know, I was a little bit challenged by my size. I was really small um, through like grade school and high school. Not anything like that bothered me. It's just I grew, I, um, grew really late. So I was never in sports like football. I wasn't like the biggest recruit, but I used to go out there and, you know, want to run every guy over. And even though I was like, you know, super short and everything and, hundred barely a hundred pounds but so then in high school or uh sort of in junior high high school I got into wrestling and I, you know that sport's all about your weight it's all size so I really took to that and I like the competitive aspect of you being even though we we're a team you know you have a guy in every weight class I was like I liked that I was out there by myself it was like one-on-one -on -one and I just got a kick out of that aspect of the sport but it was during that that I found cycling that I got introduced to cycling. And I can't really explain why, but it just became my thing. I just loved it. I just, and then from, I mean, from a really early age, I would say from the get go, I wanted to be a professional rider. And I mean, I was like 14 years old at the time, I guess, 13, 14 years old. And from there, I just set off to do that. And that's, that, I guess that's the turning point. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of people that want to be a professional athlete. You know, I mean, maybe there's more people that say, I want to be an NBA player or an NFL player than maybe a professional cyclist. Maybe I've got no idea. Um, I'm just guessing. But even still, to actually go ahead and do that is extremely difficult. What kind of dedication, what kind of commitment did it take to help you get to that level? And how did you know that was what it took to get there? That's, no, that's a great question, and I don't want to take away from the, the commitment that I put in. I don't want to say that it came easy, but to me it was just it – was, it was easy to just put my focus on that. I mean, I – especially at that early age, you know, I'd come home from school and I, I would go out and ride till the – you know, there was no sunlight. Sometimes I was running at night at midnight because I had homework and I was cross-training for cycling. and. Um, just did whatever my coach told me to do and squeezed it in. If, it, if I had to ride inside in the wintertime, I would sometimes ride five hours on an indoor trainer or 
go out and it was 30 degrees and my parents were like, where's this kid going? You know, I was like 14, 15 years old and it was like 25 degrees out and they wouldn't see me for five, you know, there weren't phones back then. I'd be gone for five plus hours out riding. And um, I guess just that desire, or at least what I felt it took, I just, um, just focus. It was, I would say it was focus because in, in uh, flip, you know, I could, you know, when I decided I or I kind of was going to retire from competition, I would say that feeling was almost the same. Like people are always like, well, why did you stop? And it was like that, that focus was gone and I knew it was gone. So it was time to, to shift gears and go a different direction. Kevin, uh, at what age did you uh, realize that you needed a mentor or you needed a coach to take you from where you were to where you wanted to go? I think I was fortunate that when I was younger, I met, uh, um, met someone in St. Louis growing up and he, um, he was this incredible coach that put so much time into us and to these young guys, you know, junior program. And um, that was really my first, you know, big mentor, apart from my older brother getting me into the sport. Um, I mean, he was really instrumental and I, I kept contact with him throughout my whole career. Um, so that, in that part, you know, I say, yeah, you just, we're lucky. We're fortunate to meet how we meet people along our path. And he happened to be a big, big influence on me. There's one thing that I loved about this story that I'm, I'm kind of pulling out. I'm maybe reaching a little bit, but it's almost the power and naivety. And by that, I mean, like you truly believed you could be a professional cyclist. I, I know, and, and even the data shows this, especially for women, they will sell themselves out of applying for a job or a role or a position if they don't have all 100% of the qualifications to get them there. And I think that sort of mentality, that almost naivety can be helpful, that almost like blind confidence, like if I keep working hard, I will eventually make it, and you did eventually make it. I think that that is a lesson that can apply in business that almost if you want to achieve something, something you want bad enough, the key is focus and just keep working at it and don't let any conditioning of any naysayers kind of ruin your, your pursuit of this because ultimately you can achieve the goals that you set out for yourselves, whether, whether it be athletics or in professional business circumstances or in any circumstance. I, I don't know. That's one thing that I'm taking out is just almost as like this notion of being uh, someone new or not, or not necessarily having all the information can help you set a new standard or new bar that perhaps someone older with quote unquote, more experience that might have said, well, this is what I think is realistic um, and, and set that bar lower than what you actually did achieve. Does that make sense? No, it totally does. I, I think that's a great, I, I like that perspective here because I sometimes look back and I, I don't think I've ever identified it as that. And I look back and I go, well, why even, you know, now as I'm older and I'm trying new things or trying to do things for in business or life or whatever it is. And I guess I've never really connected that because that, now I do exactly what you just said. You know, I, I don't have the, I'm not qualified. I can't do that. And I, I remember as I went through my career, it's almost like as you got, as I got more professional or became a professional, I started to instill these bare, you know, these uh, sort of like not roadblocks um, kind of limitations, right? Like, Oh, okay, now, you know, here I am, and but I can't do this, or maybe I'm not good enough to, to be in that, you know, to get that result. So that, that definitely, I think, does come along that maybe with age, I don't know, with age, but no, when I was younger, I, I do remember actually at about 20, I think I was still 20 right before I got my pro contract. I do remember, though, having some self-talk, like you can do, like it, I knew it was time to make that step and to actually get that, to be that pro that could maybe ride in the Tour de France. And I do remember having those conversations, you know, with myself about you can do this, like this is real, like you really can put on that, that jersey and shorts, you know, and cycling that's like the kit of a pro, of a pro rider and be on that team. So maybe, yeah, definitely the, the I guess think probably the 14, 15, maybe I don't know if it's immaturity or naivety, but um, yeah. Help. I mean, it's cool. And I think that's something that as a business leader, as all professionals, we can hear that story and say, one, anything is possible. Two, 
we hold our own self limitations that help us get us that that help that essentially inhibit us from getting what we want. Fear is the thing that holds us back from getting the things we want in life, in business, in our careers. And when we when we harbor this fear, when we harbor these insecurities, these inhibitions, it impacts us. And one of the best ways to overcome them is just kind of what you just did, Kevin, was put them out there and say, hey, you know what? This is something that I thought I couldn't achieve. And as a professional, as a leader, it could be something that we want to accomplish. Maybe it's a milestone we want with our team, whether it be sales or whether it be from a technical development perspective, or maybe for our own personal growth and our own personal trajectory of where we want to be or where we can see ourselves, having that mindset of it can still happen, I believe it can still happen, can be so critical to our own success. The moment we start letting what we think is realistic um, stop our pursuit of this, it can be difficult for us to continue to see growth. I have this really great quote I want to share. It's really quick. And then I have one a good question is, um, this was by uh, uh, Panjali. It says, when you, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all of your thoughts break their bonds and your mind transcends all the limitations and your consciousness expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new great place. And that's, I love that because it's like you were inspired by something where you, you oversaw any of the obstacles because you were driven by something else. Um, and a question that I have is you trans, you went from being a pro athlete into starting a business and what skills did you take from a pro athlete that you applied directly to starting a business and being an entrepreneur? Did they, did that help you? Uh, I hope, yeah, I hope so. I, I think that, yeah, I, I do think they helped. I, you know, I, in the beginning, I think back when I first, again, like mentorship, when I first um, stopped racing or retired from, I'm always like, people are like, you're retired. I'm like, no, no, let me clear that up. I retired from racing. I'm not retired. Um, you know, I had a neighbor who, uh, he had a business um, and he took me under his wing like really quick. It was like, hey, we got we to gotta set you up with a bank account, an LLC. Like, he's like, he just like held my hand and like we did this in like a month. I hadn't even finished up my uh, contract from my final team, you know, I was back home and you're done in the fall winter time. And by December 31st, I already had a new business filed and he had me rocking and rolling. And so, um, I found it, you know, it was really hard the first year or two to get out of that. I, I was really, I, now when I look back, it was like a process and I needed to just kind of let time go by, but I wanted to get away from that athlete, you know, being a professional at times, you're well, a lot of the time very selfish. And, uh, you know, I just was starting a family. And so I was battling a lot of these habits and things that really made me successful. I was trying to kind of dump those and figure out, you know, what was my strategy to sh making this big change in my life. And something that um, was really impactful or a conversation was um, with my father-in-law soon after I'd retired at a holiday I was kind of, you know, having some doubts about how I was going to transition and how this might maybe my business of coaching and everything. And he, I have to, I can't think of his exact words, but it was something to like, well, the good thing about you is if you just put that determination towards anything in your life, you're going to have success. And I mean, that was 20 years ago. And I, I think about that once a week, I give myself a pep talk and I remember that conversation. So. That's such a powerful story. I think that gives kudos to the power of pivoting. I mean, we've all gone through COVID over this past year. And in any business circumstance, I can't think of one company that hasn't had to pivot in some form or fashion to handle this new business environment. And I think your story of having that determination, knowing that if you set your mind to something, it will work out. And that Sometimes the first steps are the most difficult. It's the slow gains um, to getting to where you want to be is so, so difficult. Um, and, but, but by being willing to take those steps and by willing to just more or less take the steps that are required, the lumps, I guess, what you would say, to get to the point where you're starting to actually see some results, um, it, it doesn't happen overnight. And it's, can be pain and in fact typically is painful at first but that discomfort is what breeds innovation and growth 
And I think that's a lesson that any professional watching this can take home and think to themselves, okay, what are the circumstances that I'm in? And this could be pivoting in a variety of fashions. It could be personal. It'd be like, hey, I didn't have a family, but now my spouse and I are starting a family. And now I'm having to pivot my personal life to this. Or, you know, my kids were going to school. Now they're at home and I've got to figure out how to teach my kids and do work at the same time. Or it could be professional. It could be I'm transitioning into this new managerial role or I'm transitioning into this new work circumstance. These are all factors. These are all things that these professionals that are watching this right now are potentially going through and everybody's pivoting. It could be changing their business. So I think that's a great story of just needing that determination and being able to be confident that you can take yourself to the next level and that you're never too old to pivot. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Everything you just mentioned, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm like many people. I'm sort of also experiencing that big challenges in my own business and everything. And um, yeah, to that, I, to what you said about the process is slow and respecting that. And at times I think it can be a negative when I look back, uh, maybe not a big negative, but I look back on what it took through my career to get to where I ultimately, what I considered, you know, being successful in my career and you know what it takes. And so sometimes I'm like, Oh my gosh, like I gotta, you know, like you said, get, get ready for the long haul here and just get focused and um, have that, have that confidence in pushing forward. And I, also what I'm hearing is that you're, um, you don't, you didn't do it alone. And you also had a moment of vulnerability where you, you had other people helping you something that you were so good at. And then I'm pivoting and you were getting an outside perspective from someone who wasn't in the sport. I'm sure your advice would have been completely different had it been, I don't know, I would say Lance or whoever else was in there saying to you, Oh, are you crazy to do this or start this business? You should stay in doing what you're doing. Cause that's a world they know, you know, you can probably maybe have stories of your friend or people that you also know that didn't pivot. They didn't, they sort of got stuck after, right. I don't know what to do. Maybe they didn't have the resources to help them. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I'm very grateful for relationships. I've, I've, you know, formed with people and people have been great to me. I can look along my sort of path and pick out people and say that person helped, you know, this person was a big influencer and this person helped me. And, and sometimes like it's com- one conversation people, well, just as impactful, they can be positive. You have to remember sometimes I can, you can really hurt someone too, you know, like people's, like you said that, but that that's kind of easy to come by. I remember the French kind of have this saying, like if you're looking for someone of, of like negativity or of a problem, like they're on every street corner, like look yeah. for the people that are going to help you, encourage you. And hopefully you can kind of pay that, pay that back. Yeah. And talk about that for a second in terms of paying that back. And well, I would, I would apply that to managing people, managing teams, managing expectations. Um, how have you been able to transition the skills and the knowledge you learned from being a professional cyclist into building your business, but from a people management perspective and motivating your team? Like, have you ever had a stretch goal that you needed to get your team into a different gear, whether it be for your business or even in professional cycling? How did you go about motivating the people on your team to get into that gear? Um, so uh, let me have to think about that. Like, like in the teams, um, you know, we kind of, you, you, especially at the pro level that I rode at and where I got to and being in those roles of like, you know, riding with Lance Armstrong, you, you sort of figure out, and I'd assume this is the same, you figure out what you're really good at or what your role is and you, you contribute and you allow other team members to contribute and you let everyone, you want to make sure everyone can do their thing and, and shine and not be in a rush to kind of put yourself up in the forefront. Like, look at me, look how, great I am contributing to this team and um, you know I have a very small business that fluctuates in time with how many people might we might be working together and I'm pretty um, I like to well I think sometimes I'm, I'm pretty critical because I am of myself so I've had I had some people have helped me and said like you know Kevin like Sometimes, like, if you want something, I, I came up with this phrase, like, if you want something done your way, then do it yourself. If you want something done the right way, then let, allow other people to help you and do their job, you know, let them do their thing. And then another was um, just, you know, being like, 
having these ridiculous expectations probably coming off of yourself on other people. And it's not that, you know, it's not, not to sound bad, but not that you don't need a hundred percent of people's efforts, but it's not necessarily what your needs are, you know, what they can provide and get done. And so I think a bigger part of me was just learning to lead and kind of get out of my coaches and the people that were helping me or working with me, just get out of their way, give them good direction, good support. And um, just let them, you know, maybe an example would be like, you know, I, I coach often in an environment where people come in and train in like a facility with me and not really like just letting my coaches go. Like these people form relationships and like my coaches sometimes more than me. Like, and you think, Oh, I'm the head coach. I'm this guy that rode the tour and I got to run these classes. And, and really like, they're like, no, they want to relate to these coaches that have stories and, build relationships and have experiences too to share with my, my athletes or my clients. Um, so those are lessons I've learned. They sound a little bit more kind of self, maybe personal, but I hope that people that have worked with me, you know, found me to be, um, you know, to provide enough leadership, but also I believe in letting people kind of do their thing and hopefully shine. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that's a great nugget. I mean, pulling that out, maybe put it in like a 30 second version, letting people fail and not do it necessarily the way that you would have done it empowers them to be better professionals and empowers the people you work with to innovate and be innovative because you are challenging them to think on their own and not think for them. No, that's awesome. awesome. Well, Tori talked about this a second ago. I love to learn your thoughts on vulnerability. How has that played a role in your life? When have you had to be vulnerable as a leader and as a professional? Meaning that something didn't go the way you wanted it to go. I mean, I know, obviously, we've heard about, you know, Lance Armstrong and doping and, you know, all the things that were going on during the Tour de France. I would love to learn how you were able to maybe harness that type of experience and help leverage that to help you be a better professional and a better leader and allow people to learn from your story. I mean, I've, I've done interview. I did an interview recently where I was pretty candid and open about, um, you know, what went on there. And so I did talk about how that was tough post career to whatever people don't care. I don't need them to feel sorry for me. It's just, that was a tough thing to kind of come to grips with, you know, did some, I felt like, made some choices that um, were tough and you know, you can't go back and change them. You got to learn from them. And that's what I was um, when I talked about doping, you know, it's like, then you're kind of like the embarrassment. And for a while, I actually think I, I avoided doing public speaking. I know I did not actually, or I avoided doing any kind of public speaking or interviews because I kind of cringe even before anyone really knew all about the doping people would ask me, Oh, you did so great. And you know, you're a pro athlete. You're so awesome. And kind of in my head, sometimes I'd be like, yeah, I'm not that awesome. Like I kind of had this hidden story that a lot of guys went through and had to make similar decisions. Anyway, you know, kind of what got me, you know, back to our first question about just that focus as a young, you know, being a young kid and really that drive. I tend to always try to look for the the good, the right, the what's, what can I, what am I learning from a bad, you know, it might even be like a bad scenario or something really terrible, but definitely I'm, I'm always trying to find, keep grounded and say like, well, what, what can I learn from this? What's this, or what's, what, why did this happen? And um, to kind of avoid, cause it's hard to, I think it'd be hard to stay in a top, it's hard to be in that profession. And um, I guess here, I, okay, here might be an example. Like, uh, watching my kids in their sports and you know they go to a swim meet and as a parent you just want so bad for them to you want them to feel success and accomplishment and for them for themselves you know and you want them to experience things you might feel like you experienced and I remember my kids at dinner when they're little and they would um, you know be upset that they didn't do well or something and I, my wife would say well you remember daddy tell what's daddy's story about his racing I'd be like, well, how many pro races did dad do? Is, you know, and my daughter would kind of be like, oh, whatever, you did, um, you know, 
dad did a thousand races and like, okay, so how many did he win? And then my son would be like three. And then like, well, that was my career. Like I made a profession, you know, failing most of the time. And you had to figure out how to just, um, and I know I'm kind of going off topic, but another time, soon after I'd retired, we, we, I remember a conversation I had with my wife on a drive home from dinner at some, they were, they were friends, but they're really like my parents knew the parents and they lived close to us. So it's like this natural thing to introduce us to this couple. And they had some other friends over and it was really casual. We wouldn't have like a barbecue, but one of the husbands asked me a question about how did I do the tour de France? Like, even though I wasn't winning, like how did I get up every day and have that motivation? And, and I made some comment. I said, well, you know, every rider pretty much thinks he's like the best. And he thinks that on any given day, if everything were to go just right, he's the best and he's going to win. And it's not that you're like sitting around going, oh, I'm the best. But you are kind of rationalizing like, okay, I can do this. Like I could, I could possibly win today. Or I, that's the talk you got to have. You're like, I can be in the front group. Or, and uh, when we left, she's like, I just came across wrong, I think. And my, she was like, wow, you sounded really like, that was kind of weird, like arrogant. And, and to me, it was just like, no, like there's no way I could have done it that long without having, I think that kind of, at least for me, you know, I know that I've also learned that ways I think isn't like everyone, we don't all think the same and are motivated the same. And I don't think that came from like having a big ego or, but it was just, yeah, that's what it, I felt like it took. You had to be kind of, Kind of tough, you know, you had to be tough mentally for sure. Not kind of, you had to be. Yeah, I mean, if you're not in your own corner, who's going to be? And I think this applies to so many professional circumstances. When we're talking about advocating for ourselves at work, we're talking about advocating for any project that we're working on. When we're talking about trying to get our team to buy into this new thing that we're trying to innovate and implement, we have to believe that this is the number one thing. It's, uh, there's a saying that I've heard. It says, if you're going to take the island, burn the ships. Don't give yourself a plan B. Tell yourself this is the way through this wall. And the only way we're going to get through is breaking through it. And we are the one to do it. And uh, um, that, I think, makes a ton of sense. I don't think that's there again. I think there is a, there is a natural amount of, okay, open-mindedness to pivoting and iterating. I think that's good and inherent. And that is healthy. But I think that there's also a necessary need for drive and just willingness to bust through this to get to where you need to be. Because if you don't have that, if you're not willing to advocate for yourself, nobody else will. So what percentage is mindset? If you had to say it's, it's goals and it's like how important is that mindset? And, and the second part of that question is when people are, uh, I'm sure in the race, people are trying to throw you off your mental game. And how do you handle that? You, no, to, and it's it's funny. Like it's everyone's always like, oh, it's ninety nine percent mental, one percent physical, and people will people still say that. We still talk like that, but I don't really think I don't know how many people would admit that they actually they might believe it or even are willing to attempt that and practice it. But in sport, at least in cycling, like it is almost that. I mean, if you are not motivated at a race with other professionals where the difference in physical is, it's so small. It's like, I say, it's like, it's great to watch other pro sports on TV. Like when you watch boxing or football or whatever it is, or basketball, they make it look so easy, but it's because they've taken out all the little, the little things you can't see, they do so naturally and they're all at the same level. So it looks so clear to us, you know, it's like, well, why didn't he? move his head for that punch, you know, but you miss the 20 years of him in a gym learning to dodge every other punch. You know, he's dodged every other one, but he got hit by that one. Mm -hmm. So, um, sorry, I kind of lost <laughs> my thought there, but yeah, I think the, I mean, the mental is everything. It's, um, it's, it's a big part for sure. And how do you prepare yourself for negative forces? Like, you know, the, ra the races aren't all, the stars aren't always aligned in most, if you're a thousand races and you're winning a small percentage of them. I mean, I guess you're a little bit, that part of it is, is uh, personally, you, I'm sure other riders would have stories and you have to develop that self-talk and that strategy 
of how you're going to deal with it. And I've got, I, got, I think maybe those stories have given you a, a little insight maybe to my own strategy of self-talk of mm -hmm. um, sort of that, oh, tomorrow will be better. And I'm not making excuses for myself. It was, it was always like evaluate what happened and mm. kind of like learn and then move on. Don't, don't dwell on it. Definitely there's no time to dwell on it. Not on the, not in yeah. the career. Yep. Thank you. I love that. It's like success is when preparation meets opportunity. So when we're, when we're talking about a business professional, we can't think, okay, I've done no prep. I've done no uh, getting myself into this framework of skill sets to be in a position to take advantage of this opportunity and expect that I'm going to achieve these positive results. But after I've worked hard enough, gotten the skills and the experiences to get myself into a position where, you know what, on any given day, I can win this sale or I can uh, achieve this uh, technological feat or I can lead my team to this outcome. I can be that motivational leader my team needs for me, um, whatever it may be. Um, then outside of that, once, once you're on an even playing field and you know that you've got the capabilities and the, and, and the mental framework or the, sorry, the, the abilities to do it, that mental framework is so critical. The mental capacity to go ahead and say, you know what, I'm going to do this today and being intentional and focused on doing that is so critical. Um, yeah, I, I, um, that's, I totally agree. I, and just that, I used to always say too, like, I don't, I, if I'm riding in and I'm 20 minutes down, as long as I gave it like everything I had and I didn't quit, like it was just, I reached the limit. I used to always be afraid that my body wouldn't cooperate. And that's usually what I felt like happened. My body physically couldn't keep up with my mental. And that was what I kind of prided myself on. The suffering, whatever. That's like comes with the profession. Like you gotta be able to suffer. Like that's part of the deal. And for me, that was just like a, yeah, you're gonna suffer today. So it was always like, well, is my, my body gonna cooperate? Like at some point my heart rate won't go any higher. You know, I've, or you've got too much blood lactate in your legs and the muscles just physiologically, scientifically will not continue at that output, you know? And, that's kind of, I also, that was the way I approached, um, you know, I always thought like that. And I'd almost be afraid sometimes, like, oh my gosh, I, I hope that I've got it today. And I think that's probably pretty common in, in most athletes. But I, I do, I do want to share something I admire and others. I still look to sports for kind of motivation in my everyday, just, you know, life. And I just, I, I know it's a pretty brutal sport, like I, but I got into like, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I love watching the UFC on TV and there was this one fight that I'll watch over and over and it's these two guys they just went so hard on and it went all the way through it was like a championship fight it was five five minute rounds and you would think you're just sitting there at times going just quit like just give up like and the fight in this one guy is just like to me, that guy has, has such mental strength. Like, to me, it's just such an example of someone who won't quit. And like you said, he's been doing it his whole life, and he knows he's prepared. And he just knew at any moment he might catch that other guy, as long as he could, like, stay in the fight. And I'm, I just admire that so much when people have that, like, fight in them. How important was um, just your – I'm thinking of you as a team. And you're, have you ever had a situation where – the communication within your team is off and it impacted your success and how do you mitigate that? Yes, I uh, definitely for sure. Times where um, the team, just the riders, uh, you know, I'm always, obviously my, my examples here have to be in cycling and the team and um, where the riders just aren't communicating and we're not, we're not gelling. Like, you know, they talk about like a, a chase in a bike race, you know, when guys get up the road, and they get a gap, let's say they get uh, three minutes ahead of your leader and your leader's with you in a pack of 100 riders. And now it's up to you, seven, eight teammates of your leader to bring these riders back. So he, he's back in contention. And sometimes you just, you know, guys, you knew guys weren't giving it their all and your professionals or maybe one or two guys can't, they just can't help it. They're not on their game and it just doesn't come together. Well, Sometimes in some teams, and definitely in teams, we'd handle it better. Like I was in teams where guys would get in a fight, not fight like physical, but argument, you know, 
in the bus right after the race and say things to each other that, you know, some of them are hard to undo. And that doesn't create good synergy for the next day. Mm -hmm. And um, I think something that was big that I saw that I witnessed because I rode in some um, pretty big teams was like the way, especially I was with Lance in his first two wins in the U.S. Postal Service. And I just looked at other teams. and I was like, why don't they just do what we do? Like every guy was committed to him winning. I mean, every guy gave everything. But there was a pride in that because when you came down to the dinner table, you knew your other teammates were like, yeah, he had it today. He gave everything. Even when you had a bad day, they're like, he was sick. He gave everything he had. And a lot of times those guys got more credit, right? They're like, so-and-so had a bad stomach or had a fever. And the guys at the table would sit there and talk about him sitting there and talk about how awesome it was that he was able to pull for, you know, 15 miles at some crazy – pace and then he barely made it to the finish and stayed in the race so and then being in other teams where you're you got these guys that are you know as a group you should be stronger than the other teams but you just you're not a yeah and that plays into a little bit of that vulnerability is that you have such a cohesive team that he that teammates are allowed to say hey I gave it my all or you for you even to know that they gave it them all they're all and not to condone them because you're close and you understand there's that vulnerability as a team and you yeah, each yeah. got each other's back and you're working in a synergy. And that's just, like I said, just that, that showcase of the more communication and vulnerability you had within a team, the more success you experience. Maybe not winning, but just working well as well a team. It definitely translated to, to, uh, to success, for sure, when the team was uh... – Cohesive yeah. like that. This is awesome, Kevin. And even sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, just in terms of like the the energy our team would build. Like one thing coming down to your teammates to the dinner table, and often in the hotels the teams will share. Um, you know, and there'll be like five, maybe even 10, 15 teams sometimes in the same room eating. And when the team is that strong, it it like resonates out to the other teams you know it's like you go walk in to get your spaghetti or whatever and the other teams are just like oh gosh you know we got to deal with them tomorrow again they're gonna set a certain pace or and it's almost like you beat them already you beat them with that energy with a mindset that's awesome. too. yeah that's a mentality that's a crazy mentality of just like we're winners and i think that applies to business i mean i think if you're a team and you're building your team and you're, you're on a team and you come in with that mentality that our team is stronger than anybody, that we can take on giants and that this is no problem, we've got it. I think that mentality can really, really do make massive impacts, whether it be sales, whether it be technological feats, whether it be anything that you're trying to do in terms of improving your team performance or your outcome. I think that mentality that we got this and we can, we can ride with anybody or we can, we are the best that exists and we set the standard that mentality is so critical and actually believing it is so, so huge. Mm -hmm. Kevin, this was awesome. This has been an incredible lunch and learn. I know I, I know we went a little bit longer, but I think what you had to say was fantastic. I think the stories were incredible. Um, I believe everybody that's in our audience watching today has really gotten a lot out of you. I really appreciate you being here. One final question I have for you is how can our audience learn more about you, connect with your work, um, learn, connect with you in any way or fashion or form uh yes well i have a, a website for my coaching um pedalhard.com and then um i also have a group on facebook called primal eaters that i've gotten into a sort of a branched off people always ask me about nutrition or their weight or, or things like that so i've really delved into uh fasting and really uh, enjoying that so pro yeah probably just my website in there on um, find me on facebook with that group um I will say, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, I'm kind of like, oh, my God, it's like the competitiveness. I know that everything doesn't always have to be about, you know, like crushing other people and beating them. But um, it was fun. You kind of brought out some of my old kind of emotions there with um, just the competitiveness that kind of drew me to sports, too. That's awesome. Well, hey, Kevin, thanks for being here. Everybody, thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your day. See you, everybody. Yeah.